I don't remember where he is. He normally takes me to like 20 after. Well, see, I was making up for this morning. Oh, oh, you want us to get out early? <laughs> Did you hear that? He wants, to, he wants us to get out early. Y'all got enough this morning? <laughs> and the other problem was you only started the songs like one time. So actually, this is partly your problem, too, because when Bruce does it, he'll just start playing a song, and he's like, oh, that's not the right song. And then he'll start playing another song, you know. And right, right, and then it's in the wrong key. So, so you playing the right song the first time, that also messed this thing up. So I'm blaming both of you. How's that sound? Huh? Yeah, I didn't blame you. No, you did your part just fine. Yeah. Ian, uh, not so much. He's blaming the computer for jumping or something. You know, I. It was acting funny. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, you can begin turning to the Book of John. That's where we are on Sunday nights. Um, Diana, actually, uh, or Sh Sh Sharon, in that room right behind you. As soon as you walk into the right, there are some Bibles. I think if you want to go grab one. Right there. There's a Bible right. As soon as you turn into the right, I think they're on. Just as soon as you step into the right, to the right, I think there's a Bible there. And you can turn, grab that, and go to the book of John. Yep, there you go. All right, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Um, obviously, the, the, the last time that I actually preached on a Sunday night, uh, we, we started the book of John, and we got through verses 1 through 5. Tonight, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 13, and I've titled tonight's message, if you're taking notes tonight, I've titled it, titled it The Power and Purpose of Jesus. The Power and the Purpose of Jesus. So let's actually go to the passage itself, and let's read those verses. Again, this is verses 6 um, through 13. John chapter 1, verses 6 through 13. When you got it, say, I'm there. Excellent. All right, let's read. There, there came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think there's uh, five truths that we can see from this particular passage, again, regarding about the power and the purpose of Jesus. And so the first point, if you were to take notes, the first point would be that people, people can confuse power. People can confuse power. Now, here's why I say that. Let's, let's look at this passage again. Let's look at just uh, verses 6, 7, and 8, that first paragraph here. It says, there came a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. And here's the key part. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. Now, we already, again, because we're Sunday night churchgoers, we know John's story, right? We know that he's this, the one who uh, Isaiah prophesied in the Old Testament saying that there would be one who would come who would make the way straight for the Messiah, and that one is John. We also know from, uh, from Malachi that he is, if you will, the fulfillment of the spirit of Elijah. When Jesus is there on the Mount of Transfiguration with his disciples, Peter, James, and John, he actually says to them, because they ask about Elijah, didn't, wasn't Elijah supposed to come first? And he says, if you'll t receive it, he did. He did in the form of John, because he bore the same image and likeness of Elijah. 
He was one, as we know, he, he wore camel's hair, he ate honey and locusts, and he lived outside of the community. But even though this was the truth of who he was in terms of his earthly representation, there was something about him that drew people to him. And so what did we find happening in the outskirts there in the Jordan? People were getting baptized in crowds, large crowds go out to him. I mean, the fact that so many go out there that later on in Jesus' ministry, he actually asked the questions. What, what did you go out there to see? A bruised reed? No, not a bruised reed. And then he begins to teach on the, the doctrines of John and what John was and how, how he was the greatest of all men born of women until the kingdom of God. And then Jesus goes on and explains, and of the kingdom of God, he would be least. He was greatest of all men born of women, but he's the least in the kingdom of God. Pretty powerful statement, is it not? Because quite frankly, I'm not one out there on the country hillsides with the crowds and the throngs coming to me. And, and I don't think any of y'all have that ministry right now either, do you? And yet... And yet Jesus says of your ministry and of my ministry that John's ministry was lower than ours. Because what was John's ministry about? It was the port foretelling. It was the pointing to Jesus. But what is our ministry? It's actually saying we know him. He is in us. He indwells us. And we now tell people how they can have a relationship with him. And therefore, our ministry is actually a greater ministry than John. Now, having said all that, it's still easy because the crowds are coming. It's, it's so many people are coming that it gets the attention of the religious leaders. And so they come out. And what does John say to them? What? Who warned you? What are you doing out here? You guys are just a brutal vipers. What are you doing out here? You guys are wicked and evil. Are you coming to repent? You know? And then they don't know. And then even later on in Jesus' own ministry, as he's talking with them, he's like, they're like, where did you get his authority? And Jesus says, I'll tell you what. I'll answer your question. I'll tell you by whose authority I do this if you tell me where John got his authority. And all of a sudden, they're kind of like, whoa. If we say that he wasn't a prophet, the people are going to stone us. If, we say, he's, if he, we say he is a prophet, he's going to ask us why we didn't listen to him. So we just better say, we don't know. And so Jesus then says, well, then neither will I tell you by whose authority I do this. <laughs> okay? So crowds are coming to such an extent that the religious leaders, they hear about it and they want to go out and investigate it. That's quite a following. That's quite a statement in and of itself. But he's not the Messiah. He's not the real power. And I think, unfortunately, we live, especially today, and this again, this, I think I, it is in the heart of humanity. It has always been in the heart of humanity. But I think for whatever reason, it, today, it just seems in my personal mind, I could be wrong, but it just seems to be more rampant today because of our media fixation but i mean i think th think back just go back you know to like like jim jones for example right all of a sudden he he, he has this this cult-like following because of his persona and people then began to confuse the message with the messenger and then the messenger got confused and started believing that he was the message right Okay, now that was an old, that's an old example, all right? Yeah, uh, yeah they, that's still, okay, why, I just now looked at Carson and, and uh, the other fellow next to her. You know, we don't, we don't even talk about him, okay? Uh, yeah, sorry, I apologize, Seth. Uh, okay, they don't know who that guy probably is because that's the 90s. When's your birth date? See what I mean? They don't even have a clue who David Koresh is. No, they, they, that's still 90s. Brands Davidians is still 90s. 
Well, I know I, that's what I'm saying. That's even that's what I'm saying. I don't think either one. Do you all know who Jim Jones is? Okay, you two. Your job is to take him home and watch the Jim Jones movie. As bad acting as it is, go take them home and watch it, and then they'll at least know what we're talking about, okay? Here, okay, let's take it from there. And again, this will still be an example they're not going to get, all right? What happened also in the, in, the, in the 80s with, like, Jimmy Swagger, right? Jimmy Swagger, man, I'm talking millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars coming into his ministry, right? Same thing with Jim Baker, millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars going into his ministry. Then, all of a sudden, we find out they're both crooks and scoundrels, and when that happens, what happened across churches across the board? All of a sudden, it was like, these two guys, if they can't be trusted, then how can a local pastor be trusted? And local churches actually suffered as a result of their ministries. Just a result of their ministries. Okay, so what was the problem? What was the problem? And, I, and this is what I'm saying. And if, and if it was bad then, if it was bad in the 70s, if it was bad in the 80s, if it was bad in the 90s with with David Koresh and, the, and that kind of stuff, and the Branch Davidians, if it was bad then, how much more so today with, with Christian celebrities? Right? I mean, hmm? Right, right, Hillsong, perfect example. With Brian, or even take it, even tell you, look, I listen to the guy, I, watch, I listen to this guy every single week. I'm telling you the truth, I listen to his sermons every single week. But we've got we got celebrity pastors in the United States now. I mean, Stephen Furtick is a guy that everybody's, oh, Stephen Furtick, Stephen Furtick, Stephen Furtick. They got great music at Elevation Church. I kind of like Elevation Worship. I listen to it regularly. It's good stuff, all right? Or Craig Rochelle. But these guys, at the end of the day, if they ever start believing their own press, if they ever start believing their own message, and they start to believe that they're the messenger, then are we any different than the problem that's going on here in this first scene? So we need to be very careful that we don't follow the person and the personality. We need to follow the only one who's worthy of being followed, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And so it's easy, though, when all the stuff happens, that you start believing your press clippings. And when that happens, it's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. So let us not believe our own press clippings because, and, and let me just say this, none of us are as bad as some people think we are, and none of us are as good as other people think we are, okay? It's just a reality of the situation. So people can confuse power. That then leads us to the next set of verses, which is in verse 9, we see though, that even though people can confuse power, Jesus came for all people. He came for everyone, in spite of false messengers. He came for everybody, or in, or in spite of, because John was not a false messenger, or in spite of people's putting the wrong attention on a good messenger. Jesus still came for them all. So that's what verse 9 is all about. He said, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens just a handful of people. No, I didn't say that. Mine's wrong? You're right, because mine says every man. Enlightens every man. Because, as we know, this book is God's word to us. This is the full revelation of who we have of God. In other words, there will be nothing, there is no new revelation. And if new revelation comes that is in contradiction to this, guess what it's not? It's not revelation. It has to be right here. This is the word of God. And it is the fullness of what we need to know about who God is and what his character is like. He never changes and he never deviates from it. And in here we are told all about Jesus and what Jesus' work was and what Jesus did and who his work was for. And we are told that Jesus came for all people. Every people, tongue, tribe, race, nationality, you name it. He came for us all. And so now, due to the Great Commission, it is our job to make certain that we spread that word so that all people can hear it and have an opportunity to respond to it, that they might be saved. 
So Jesus is the real answer. And he came for everyone. And so if somebody comes along and says, oh, no, no, Jesus came just for the elect. I'm telling you, that's dangerous theology. And a lot of people believe it. Jesus came for everyone. Now, is it true that only elect are going to receive him? Yes, but it doesn't change his intention nor his heartbeat. He came for everyone. And he shed his blood for everyone. Okay? You understand the distinctions? That point was short. Third point is going to be short too. So Jesus came for all people. Third point, but not all people received Jesus. <laughs> no way. Are you kidding me? Yes, let's look at the next two verses. So verse 10. He was in the world... And the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own received, uh, did, uh, and those who were his own did not receive him. Now that is one of the saddest passages of Scripture in the entire Bible. Jesus went out of his way. He left heaven. And when you guys got to understand this, you've got to, you've got to fully grasp this. We've talked about this before. We've talked about this before, but in heaven. And we talked about it even a little bit this morning. But in heaven, how is God's will done in heaven? Is, is there ever a single time where an angel in heaven goes, man, God, I don't, I don't know if that's a really good idea. I think we should do this. Does that ever happen in heaven? No, not one time. Not one time, not one time since, since the battle with, with Satan, Lucifer, and his demonic horde, not one time since then has there ever been a conversation with the angels of heaven going, I, I think there could be a better way. Every single command that God ever gives in heaven is instantaneously, at that moment, obeyed. Okay? Now I want you to also think about this. We're told um, in John chapter 4 that God is spirit, Right? And so Jesus, before his incarnation, is what? Spirit. And we know that God's spirit is everywhere. It's called omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is here right now. And at this very moment, he's in China, on the other side of the world. He is everywhere. At this very moment, he's at Pluto. You see what I'm saying? There's not a place that he is not. He's God. This is who Jesus was before the incarnation. But as soon as he comes and becomes incarnate, what does Jesus have forever more? A human form. And not just for his 33 years on earth. When Jesus said to his father, I will go, he was saying, I will go forever and be perpetually forever 100 god and 100 man simultaneously again a concept that's beyond my grasp and my comprehension but it is a reality of the truth of the scriptures of the word of god and so therefore we hold it by faith it is the truth he's fully god he's fully man at the exact same time and so now forevermore so even, so even like, for example, when we jump to the book of Revelation and God is there on the throne and he is holding the scroll and he said, who is worthy to open the scroll? And John starts to weep because nobody is found worthy. And the angel kind of like, stop that. Look, behold, the Lamb of God. And then all of a sudden Jesus shows up and he is a disfigured lamb. And at the exact same time, he is a victorious lion. But he's this disfigured, wounds still there forever, bearing the mark of his work of salvation. This is Jesus. So I want you to, get, I want you to think about this. This is the dwelling he had. No pain, no sickness, no hurt, no nothing. He left that to become like us and to experience... Every temptation that we've ever experienced. And that at the cross of Calvary to literally take on himself every bit of pain, sickness, death, disease, 
torture, wrath, all of it. Takes it all. Every bit of it. Something that none of us could do because none of us are God. And this is the work that Jesus did. Okay? And, 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 he, and so he does this and he says, I love them so much, I will go to them. And then they rejected him. I don't even understand it. To this very day, I still don't grasp how somebody can hear the truth of the gospel and walk away. To know that the infinite love of God is so vast that he did this for us. And people walk away as if it's some kind of folk tale or fantasy that it doesn't transform our lives more than what it actually does that we don't literally day by day moment by moment breath by breath sit there in just awe of the glory of what jesus christ did for us and we just take it as for granted may we never take it for granted may we never lose sight of the work of jesus christ May it always be perpetually before us, and may it make every decision we make determined based upon that reality. And let us begin to live by faith and not by the sight and the evidence of this world. But these folks, these folks, we read it even this morning, even in his hometown. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this the brother? of james and jonas and judas and then the third one i just forgot and his sisters aren't they among us i mean that's how the crowd looked at him may that not be the way that we look at him and may that not be the way that we portray him to people because he is not one that should just be looked over or dismissed he is god and man and we should receive him So some, Jesus came for all people, but not all people did receive him. But praise the Lord. This is your fourth point, but praise the Lord. Some people did receive him. Praise the Lord for verse 12. Because then we get to verse 12 and it says, but as many as received him. Is that you tonight? Are you counted in this group as, as, as many as received him? If you have, if you've cried out, said, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner then the remainder of this verse is about you. So it is the rest of the verse about you. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Well, this is the stuff I've been trying to teach. This, This whole concept that you are the child of God, I'm telling you, I don't know if the church understands what that means. How many times have you heard me say, you are the righteousness of God in Christ? This is who you are. And yet, how many times do we have, when we talk about it, I've done this before, I've done this with the, all of you guys on so many occasions over these past many years. How many times have I, have, many times have I said, you know, um, the, the old expression, some of the traditions that we hold to, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, you're not. No, you're not. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. He doesn't look at you as a sinner saved by grace. He looks at you as his child, completely and utterly filled by the blood of Christ Jesus, cleansed forevermore for all of your sins, past, present, and future. If you don't believe me, go read the book of Hebrews. Every bit of your sin was covered. In fact, when you get to like Ephesians, Oh my goodness, Ephesians is this amazing thing where Christ is in you, but you are in Christ. Christ is in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is in God. It's like you're like super vacuum protected. There's literally nothing. There is no sin that is going to ever taint you from God's perspective. Nothing. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. I, look, I don't know. Look. You guys, you, we, 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 do, we are saints who choose to sin. You've heard me say that. That's who we, we are, saints, and we choose to sin. And when we sin, does it affect our relationship and communication with the Father? Absolutely it does. But does it affect the way that the Father looks at you? No. And that's the point. 
it never affects the way the Father looks at you. The Father doesn't look at you and go, oh, you dirty, rotten, scoundrel child of mine. Why would you have done that? He knew you were going to do it. That's why his blood covered your sins, past, present, and future. The only reason that 1 John 1, 9 is there isn't for God's benefit. It's for your benefit. It's so that you can get the communication lines right. Not for God to get the communication lines right. He's already given them to you. Remember, every promise in God is yes and amen. 2 Corinthians 1, 20. This is the promise of God. So as, as a believer in Jesus, as a child of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, as the Son of God, we are told that we have the confidence, the assurity, that we can enter into the throne room of God at any point, at any time, no matter what the circumstances. You could have spent the entire day living in filth and sin, and you as a child of God could walk into the throne room, and he'd say, there's my son, there's my daughter. Do you understand? The Father's perspective of you did not change when you chose to sin. Because you have Christ in you, you are in Christ, Christ is in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is in God. Sin cannot taint you. This is what this is all about. Now again, does that mean that you get the license and the privilege to go out there and sin? No. Quite frankly, quite frank, I'm telling you, if we really understood this, if we really understood this child of God thing, it is actually grace that would prevent us from stepping into sin. Because we know just how loving he is. We know how kind he is. We know how gracious he is. We know how powerful he is. We know how much he does love us. And everything within us would just be like, I get to serve you. I get to love you. I get to have this confidence. I get to have this relationship. I get to call you Abba Father. Why would I want to mess that up? It's not a license to sin, it's a deterrent to sin. If you understand who you are and whose you are, it's a deterrent to sin. He's amazing, he's good, he's glorious. His love is always right. All of his gifts are good gifts. There's never a single motive of evil in our Father, none. And he says, he says, blood, we take it by faith. Everything is taken by faith. His word says to whoever received him, they would become the children of God. You may not feel like a child of God. He doesn't care what you feel. He cares about the statement of the statement that he's made about you. If you have received him, then you are his child. Feelings are just that. Their feelings, they come and they go. There's days I feel happy. There's days I feel sad. There's days that I'm really excited about something. There's days I'm actually fearful of things. Did that change my position in the position of God or my relationship with God? Not one little bit. It didn't change anything with my relationship with God. He's still my loving father who calls me his son. And so those days that I feel more excited, those days that I feel more of the presence of God, and I feel it, does that make me any more holy than the day in which I'm wrestling with fear and doubt and struggles? No! Because my feelings are irrelevant to the statement of God, and so what I need to learn to do is to receive, appropriate, by faith, what God says about me. Well, that's the hard part. Because you know the thoughts you have. <laughs> I know the thoughts I have. And so it becomes difficult, but we've got to appropriate it by faith. That's what it's all about. To whosoever would receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And then, and then it's this last verse that we get to this power part. Okay, so remember the sermon title was the power and purpose of Jesus. And so we, we started with the, the people can confuse power and we're going to end with power. So power kind of, you know, is the, the bread on each side in the middle was the purpose. And the purpose was the, the meat in between the pieces of bread. So the power was people confuse power and Jesus is the real power. And we're going to read here in this last verse what this power is all about. But here in the middle, the purpose was that Jesus came for everybody. Not everybody received him but some did.
So the relationship is the middle. The power is on the ends. Okay? So let's look. God is the real power. Let's look at this last verse. Who? So, so let me actually, I'm going to read it with verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Who, now, so who is this? Who is this next part? This who in verse 13? It's those who received him. Those who received Jesus. Who received Jesus were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, do you understand the whole point of this is, where did salvation begin? Where did it originate? It originates in God. This is the reason why one of our favorite passages of scriptures, especially the Southern Baptist, is that the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith is Christ Jesus. Right? So who's the author? When it means the author, who's the beginning of it? God. Who's the perfecter of it? The one that brings us into eternity? God. So the power, every aspect of the power of our very life, our very ability, from the very moment that we cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me a sinner, to the very moment we enter into his presence and glory, whether by rapture or death, from moment to moment, that entire dash is wrapped up in the power of God. And we, as his children, just need to learn to live in it. And it's not always easy, but we can do it in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, my hope of glory. Do you all understand? All right, let's close in prayer. I'll give you 15 minutes back from this morning. How's that sound? It's still not enough, but I'll give you 15 back from this morning. Father, I am so grateful for the work what Jesus does. I, I am so grateful that, that my salvation is not dependent upon anything that I do. I'm so grateful that, that because I am a child of the King, I'm able to go into your presence. I am so grateful for that. I am so grateful that because of what you've done in me, so much of our life is just the appropriating by faith the things you've already done. Like the stuff we're learning about even in the morning time with healing. Father, it is yours. It is yours to dispense. It is yours to give. And every good gift from you is a yes and an amen. Every promise that you give is a yes and an amen. And your promise is that we are your children if we will cry out and believe in Jesus Christ. That's your, pro that's your promise. And we receive it by faith. So, the Father, be with us as we leave this place. As we leave here, may we exemplify your glory as we leave here. May we be salt and light in the midst of darkness as we leave here. May we show the evidential change of Christ in us, our hope of glory. Lord, we love you, Lord Jesus. We, we want to brag on you. We want to adore you. We want to fellowship with you. We want to experience you. And so we ask all this in your precious, holy, powerful, wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed. You all have a great evening.